Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where we don't sacrifice quality to chase the algorithm. United States history is full of outlaws. Most of them were driven by nothing more than greed. Quite frankly, they weren't very nice people. But one man in North Carolina began breaking the law to fight an oppressive government, and along the way he helped the poor. Today, we bring you the story of Henry Barry Lowry, a man who declared war on the people who wanted to make him a slave. The Lumbee. Today, many inhabitants within the boundaries of Robeson County, North Carolina, identify as Native American. They claim to be descended from the Lumbee tribe. The name of the tribe is derived from the Lumbee River, which passes through their lands. The origins of these Native ancestors aren't entirely clear. In 1753, survey parties traveled throughout the county to determine how many Native inhabitants lived there. The report claimed that there were no Native Americans in the area. Tax records from 1768, just 15 years later, showed that 35 families were living in the county. Most of them were not white. Although the wealthy elite married within their own social circles, the working classes were more fluid in their relationships. Their unions produced children of mixed ancestry who were part white, part African American, and in some cases part Native American. These mixed-race inhabitants were called free persons of color. They were not condemned to a life of slavery, but they also weren't allowed the same rights and privileges as white landowners. The families that would one day become known as the Lumbee tribe did not submit to government demands easily. In 1773, the residents of Robeson County decided to quit paying taxes and rent. The British government sent soldiers to enforce the law, but they left empty-handed, complaining about the lawless people that inhabited the area. As the United States assumed control over North Carolina, little changed for the Lumbee tribe. But a nearby slave rebellion would create hardships for their people, and it would give birth to an outlaw. Turner's Slave Rebellion in the early 1800s, the southern part of the United States contained over two million slaves. Some of them were unwilling to accept this fate. Nat Turner was born in Southampton County, Virginia on October 2, 1800. As a young child, it became apparent that he would grow into a very intelligent man. Nat learned to read and write, which was forbidden knowledge for a slave. In 1821, Nat Turner escaped from the plantation that owned him, but after nearly dying from hunger, he voluntarily returned to his previous life of bondage. After resigning himself to a life of servitude, Nat married and had children. But in 1823, his master died. Nat Turner was sold to one plantation while his wife and children were sold to another. Over the next several years, Nat began holding religious services. He would preach to his fellow slaves. And he also told them of visions that were delivered from God. The visions kept telling Nat that he and his fellow slaves needed to revolt and kill their masters. On August 21, 1831, Nat's slave rebellion began. He enlisted the help of 70 people. Most of them were fellow slaves. A few were free persons of color who chose to support the cause. They traveled from house to house, freeing the slaves that were found. The angry band of rebels also used knives and hatchets to kill the white families that lived in these homes. The rebellion killed almost 60 people. It suddenly ended when the state militia arrived and defeated Nat Turner's small army. All of the captured slaves were beheaded by the state militia. Nat Turner evaded capture until October 30th. He was put on trial and sentenced to death. The public hanging took place on November 11th. Virginia legislators were angry at free persons of color, so they created new laws to help keep them under control. One of the new laws ensured that non-whites were denied the right of trial by jury. If a non-white person was found guilty of a crime, the punishment was enslavement. Most importantly, only white people were allowed to own firearms. Other southern states decided to pass similar laws, including North Carolina. Within a few years, it triggered another round of violence. The Lowry Gang Henry Barry Lowry was born in Hopewell, North Carolina in 1845. He was one of 12 children. The family identified as members of the Lumbee tribe, but were legally considered free persons of color. 
Originally, the Lowry family had a much larger farm, but they were in political conflict with nearby communities during the Revolutionary War. Over the next several decades, most of the farm was lost piece by piece through various lawsuits. And of course, since the Lowry family wasn't white, they weren't allowed to receive an education or own weapons. When the Civil War began in 1861, the Confederate government confiscated slaves. They were required to build forts and railroads and work on other projects that helped the war effort. But in 1862, a yellow fever epidemic tore through the South and killed many slaves, so the government arrested free people of color and forced them into servitude to compensate for the lost labor. White men who were exempt from serving in the Confederate Army instead participated in the Confederate Home Guard. The Home Guard was responsible for finding deserters and runaway slaves. They were also responsible for rounding up free people of color and putting them to work. Henry Lowry and his older brother evaded capture by hiding in nearby swamps. They joined forces with another group of outlaws hiding out there. The newly formed Lowry gang spent most of its time safely hidden, but the outlaws left the swamp on occasion to steal supplies. As the war progressed, the Lowry gang grew larger. They attracted other free people of color. A few Union prisoners of war who escaped from captivity joined the group. Confederate soldiers who deserted also entered the gang. The most violent man among them was undoubtedly Henry Lowry. On December 21, 1864, a neighbor accused Henry of stealing a hog. Henry responded by killing the man. The following year, there were rumors about a Confederate conscription officer who was rude to the women in the Lowry family. In January 1865, Henry shot the officer because of his poor manners. These two murders would result in swift retaliation, and it would trigger yet another war. The Lowry War in March 1865, the Confederate Home Guard punished the Lowry family for Henry's actions. As Henry hid in the bushes and watched, officers from the Home Guard entered his father's home. They found firearms, which were forbidden for free persons of color. After a short court proceeding in the front yard, Henry's father and brother were shot for breaking the law. Henry Lowry was now the undisputed leader of the Lowry gang, and he made sure that the group of outlaws remained free. Most importantly, they kept stealing. The Civil War finally came to an end in April. Henry emerged from the swamp and returned home, hoping to leave violence behind him. On December 7th, he decided to settle down and married his cousin Rhoda Strong. Before the wedding celebrations could begin, the state militia arrived and arrested Henry for the men he killed. He didn't remain in prison for long. Henry used a file to cut the bars and escaped into the swamp again. This event also marked the beginning of what would be known as the Lowry War. For the next several years, Henry and his gang continued their life of crime. In addition to stealing, they also made it a point to kill many of those responsible for the execution of Henry's father and brother. The government responded by marking Henry as a wanted man. A large bounty was placed on his head, but the locals were unwilling to turn him over to authorities. Although the Lowry gang were notorious thieves, they were not greedy. Henry would return money and belongings to the gang's victims if it could be proven that the person couldn't afford to lose what little they had. If the gang stole horses or wagons, they were returned to the proper owners at a later time. Henry and his band of outlaws were also known to give their stolen money and food to the poor people of the county. After the Civil War, officials who supported the Union cause temporarily replaced the local government. In 1868, they offered Henry Lowry a deal. They would ensure he received a fair trial if he turned himself in. Henry agreed and turned himself over to authorities. Many white residents who supported the Confederacy were angry about Henry being kept alive. Rumors spread about a plan to assault the prison, kidnap Henry, and kill him. Instead of waiting around to die, Henry escaped from prison again, and his gang continued their years-long crime spree. But the success of Henry's criminal organization would not last forever. The Disappearance of Henry Robeson County, North Carolina had several elections in 1870. Many of the Confederates who once fought against the Union won their contests. They were once again in control of the state and one of the things they wanted to do was kill Henry Lowry. 
On October 3, 1870, the Lowry gang robbed a still used to make whiskey. They stole as much of the spirits as they could carry. The gang also beat a man nearly to death. Next, they cut another man's ears off. A local posse was formed to catch the outlaws, but the gang retreated again into the swamp. The state militia surrounded the swamp, but they would not enter it. They planned to wait until the gang had to leave. Henry knew that he wouldn't be able to hold out forever, so he began making secret plans with a man named John Saunders. John said he could help Henry and his gang leave North Carolina entirely and disappear into the Western Territories. Henry discovered that this helpful friend was a spy. John was going to turn them over to authorities, so Henry killed John and then returned to stealing what he needed. The Lowry gang committed their final robbery in February 1872. The gang robbed a local sheriff and took $28,000 from his safe. That would be equivalent to about $630,000 today. A $12,000 bounty was placed on Henry's head in response, but nobody would ever collect it. Soon after the robbery, Henry disappeared. According to members of the Lowry gang, Henry was cleaning his shotgun. It went off by accident and removed his head. Henry was dead. Henry's wife Rhoda said that isn't what happened. She claimed that Henry left North Carolina and was very much alive. She maintained this claim for the rest of her life. However, she also remarried a couple of years after Henry's disappearance. Several years after Henry's accidental death, he was supposedly seen at a funeral in North Carolina, but his attendance was never confirmed and nobody ever claimed to see him again. Without Henry's leadership, the Lowry gang didn't last long. Within a few months of Henry's disappearance, most of his fellow outlaws were killed in fights with the local militia. Only one member of the gang was ever caught. He was put on trial and hanged for his crimes. Henry's legend has lived on. There are legends among the Lumbee tribe which claim that during times of great hardship, the ghost of Henry Lowry has returned to fight for his people. Additionally, there are several roads named after him. Most notably, Henry Barry Lowry College performs a play every year that celebrates Henry's life. They also sell t-shirts and hats with the slogan, Henry Barry Lowry Lives Forever. Was Henry Lowry a hero, or was he just a common criminal with an unusually long career? More to the point, should he be celebrated today? Let us know what you think about this strange but exciting tale in the comments below. If you like that we keep bringing you strange tales every week, it would be great if you could help us in return. Please like this video, and if you watch another episode, that would make us very happy. Also, we do have a Patreon, we accept PayPal donations, and we have a small merch store. Links are in the video description if you're interested. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.